In front of reporters, Representative Yoho called me, and I quote, a fucking bitch. It's the Social Security Trust Fund. That's a woman for you. I ask you to get my shirts whiter. Welcome to The Witch Podcast, your weekly opportunity to audio explore the myths that fuel internalized misogyny and get pretty mad and sad about the state of the world. Cool cool intro, Lauren. I'm your pod host and biggest fan, Lauren Eckert, and we are joined today again by Reed, my little brother, for the last in our short series on the witch trials of the early modern period of Europe. Welcome back, Reed. Hello. Nice to have you here tonight. I feel incredibly weird about uh, talking through a wall <laughs> at you. This is very strange. We're literally there's a wall between us, but we have to record separately. Otherwise, the mics get all messy. Um, so we're doing our best. <laughs> so for the for listeners at home, the first time Reed and I recorded, I was in a wall tent, and Reed was here in the house. We're both sharing now, and then. The second time we recorded in the same room and drank beers, which was really fun, but also hell to um, audio edit if you don't have fancy gear. And so now we are in the same house roommates talking to each other through our computers. And I hate it. I hate the vibe. So that's sort of where we're starting off. Yay. <laughs> good energy. Those good energy. Good energy to start off a, <laughs> uh, what is sure to be a very lighthearted podcast it's experience. Not, it's not. I promise mm. you it won't be. Wait, this podcast? No, I believe it or not, we're going to get into some shit. Oh, okay. That's good to know mm-hmm. as we... <laughs> in the third part of our three-part series. Yeah, mentally prepare yourself. It doesn't get better from here on. Oh, boy. Um, so again, this is part three. In, in our mini series. So if you haven't listened to the first two, the prior two episodes, maybe hop back in time a couple of episodes and start at part one. Read last episode, we covered some really gnarly historical realities. We talked about the Malleus Maleficarum, the Bible's misogyny, and the inescapable consequences of the accusation of being a witch, particularly if you were a woman in the early modern period in Europe. Yeah. What we are going to do today is try and figure out why the hell this happened, besides the obvious misogyny, and what it means for all of us today. And perhaps sense-making of this kind of senseless, widespread human violence and tragedy is futile. But after our first two episodes, episodes, I I also feel compelled to try and dig into why the hell this happened. Reed, are you ready to get into it? Yeah, I guess uh, here we go. (laughs) Strap in for a wild ride, I guess. All right. So a quick recap from our last two episodes. Scholars tend to accept that 60,000 to 100,000 people were killed and their death was formally recorded during the witch trials, but many more died in prison by mob or due to secondary effects of their accusations. Enough people were impacted by this long-lasting event in human history. In particular, women were impacted by this event. And enough people died to fundamentally change the way we collectively think about women, gender, and our neighbors in this time period and in the hundreds of years to follow. So why the fuck did this mass hysteria, this violence happen? So I'm going to share today with you, Reed, a number of scholarly theories that I've come upon that try and make sense of this period of time and all that came with it. None of them are particularly satisfying, as you might expect, but it's really, really, really interesting the way scholars and historians, feminist scholars have used social, political, historical biological clues to try and get at why this may have gone down the way it did. So Reed, before I jump into it, having been with us for part one and part two, Mm -hmm. 
Do you feel like you walked away having any sense to be made out of what we talked about? Like, like, or maybe you've been exposed to potential causes, uh, interrelated causes to these events through your post-secondary education. Yeah, I think that, you know, it feels like so long ago that we were recorded. I'm not <laughs> sure if it has been a long time or if it's just uh, time It's just a time is right a flat now. circle now. Yeah, um, but I, I do feel like I have some um, exposure to some ideas Mm -hmm. about why this might have occurred i feel like most uh prevalently is a kind of marxist economic uh reading of it Mm -hmm. it, which Mm -hmm. is treating um this as kind of a primitive resource grab um which i think i might have mentioned in previous episodes i'm not sure if it made it into the episode itself um but kind of treating it as a primitive resource grab where by controlling women and their reproductive rights um and kind of, you know, controlling society through uh, women, you are able to procure a stable um, resource of labor. Um, as so, so there's a kind of a commodification of reproduction in a way, um, unpaid commodification of reproduction. Um, I've also heard, you know, some theories about um, kind of a religious base to it, but mm-hmm. the marxist reading is the one that i'm most familiar with yeah that's a great intro to it and we'll really get into that because i think sylvia federici one of the scholars most responsible um for developing for fleshing out that theory that lens through which to look at um the witch trials and hunts and what would follow i one thing i like about her interpretation is how forward looking it is how it sort of explicitly points out modern impacts of the terror campaign that led to the death of hundreds of thousands of people, mostly women during this time period. So that's a good place to start. And actually, I'll leapfrog um, off of your reference to Sylvia Federici's theories and start with a quote from her before we get into why the hell people theorize this happened. So Sylvia Federici, I I brought her up in the first episode of this series. She is the author of Women, Witches, and Witch Trials, among many other books. Uh, She's an Italian-American scholar, teacher, and activist, and a radical autonomous feminist Marxist. And she's a professor emerita and teaching fellow at Hofstra University. And Sylvia Federici says... It is only by keeping this, the memory of the witch trials, alive that we can prevent it from being turned against us. Which was a justification for talking as much as we did about this anyway. And as I brought up in the first chapter of this exploration, I'm still flabbergasted about how little I knew of this time period, both because of just like the historical terror and wrongs and like human wrongs that it caused but also because it really does live in our the ramifications live in our society and in our bodies today so um i like to leverage federici's words as we get into it so i'll start with one of the earliest interpretations of why the early modern period witch trials happen um and so a 19th century interpretation of these violent events posited that the women persecuted in the early modern period were pagan priestesses and members of an underground witch cult which aligned themselves with ancient pagan goddess worship. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know which one, this interpretation has widely been debunked uh, via historical records that make clear the diversity and scale and beliefs and um, occupations of people persecuted and killed during this period. So if you hear someone bring up witch trials and they're convinced that everyone killed was actually part of an underground secret witch cult that has uh, been thoroughly debunked. I feel like that'd be wild to hear somebody say like, no, 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 didn't you know? They were all like... (laughs) <laughs> it was all a witch cult like i don't know how to react like w- i don't know how i would react to somebody saying that to me <laughs> other than like recommending they go see a therapist 
It's interesting because that was actually like an early feminist scholarly interpretation of what had happened. Um, but again, this emerged in the 19th century. And so I, I think a lot of things probably obfuscated the reality of the situation. Like maybe with the information available to them at the time, that was a more reasonable conclusion to draw than it is now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting. I'm not positive on you know anything um let alone like I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all but i feel like even then god it's so hard to kind of place yourself in um it's a kind of a practice we have to do frequently as people who study you know the past or the ancient past it's kind of that practice of like here are the core beliefs of these people now i need to kind of inhabit these beliefs to kind of draw mm-hmm. conclusions about what this book might have meant to somebody, you know, what is the uh, not work on this, you know, hut and sue, burial helm mean, um, kind of pick apart meanings like that. But it sometimes it's just so challenging to try to do it. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Yeah, it's an, like also apparently in, in the case of imagining that you think hundreds of thousands of men and women were killed because they were part of an underground proto-indo-european paganistic cult um so yeah that is one theory that i thought was worth mentioning because i saw it come up in a couple of places where i was researching and was like what the hell is this and dug into it and yeah found that it's not widely um accepted nor tolerated as an explanation for the events of this time So starting there and launching into a much more nuanced, complicated proposal of understanding, of putting ourselves in the shoes of people who lived during this time period and people who died during this time period. You know, humans are sense-making creatures, as is clear today through the fact that we're making this episode, as is clear through the wide-ranging existence of conspiracy theories that attempt to string together every mystery of being into a black and white story of good versus evil. You know, like, I don't know, think maybe QAnon? The accusation of witchery may have been one byproduct of sociopolitical and environmental turmoil of the moment in Europe and beyond. So read as we kind of set up in the first episode of this series, the Black Death had killed millions of people in the early modern period horrifically. Many wars waged on for 30 plus years. The Little Ice Age caused widespread crop failure and famine and earthquakes shook Europe. Without modern medical and scientific understandings, and might I add, still sometimes with and despite modern medical and scientific understandings, false scapegoats were created to overcome the terror that living through that sort of social, political, economic, environmental uncertainty would create. And I think, like we talked about this in the last episode, but I think we can all sort of, in a very strange way, empathize to a degree with that reaction to suffering and uncertainty. I mean, we're seeing an explosion of conspiracy theorists and extreme thinking in the modern developed world right now because it taxes our resilience to go through a plague even when we know what the hell the plague is. Like imagine if we were just everyone was getting sick and dying and we had no effective ways to treat them and didn't know germs existed. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to conceptualize, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, obviously, like you alluded to with QAnon and stuff, there's definitely a tendency to kind of come make sense of the world in a time where the world is hard to make sense of. Um, and yeah, I just kind of feel like that is very apparent and almost understandable. Mm -hmm. Almost. To Um, a certain degree. Maybe not the violence, but like the desire to make sense of human tragedy. Yes, definitely. So witches were often persecuted after disaster had befallen a community or individual. And so this is one way that scholars and historians have tried to explain this time period. Well, the social uncertainty... um, was and social, economic, environmental uncertainty was so profound 
that it was an act of regaining power to find someone in the community who is maybe an outcast already and blame them for the crop failure that you've had or blame them for the fact that your child died or you know it it was it was a means of feeling like you had some degree of control or could punish the person responsible for your situation and i think there's something attractive about that explanation only in so far as it would explain sort of like why in this moment we it, that it was actually this calamity of a bunch of different tragic events and uncertainties that led to the witch trials. However, that sociopolitical environmental explanation doesn't well explain the mass hysteria that occurred and the gender imbalances of the trials, right? And, and in addition to that, I found additional research that is a major challenge to these theories being successfully applied across what we know of witch trials in the early modern period. Um, declines in witch hunts in some communities where they happened at the large scale, the declines of those hunts correspond with objective increases in hardship. So throughout history, we'll, we'll actually see the decline of the killing of <laughs> people, particularly women, because of accusations of witchcraft, even in events of increasing plague, famine, economic collapse, etc. So the two don't always correlate very well. So another uh, posited theory by Edward Miguel in a 2003 paper suggests that maybe the witch trials were a means for society to eliminate the financial burden of unmarried women or widowed women across communities. Now, I find this one uh, less comforting as an explanation to why this emerged, this idea that humanity would have a human problem and lack the imagination to deal with it any other way than through widespread terror campaigns and murder of innocent people. Um, to support his theory, Miguel provides that the proportion of unmarried women had climbed to nearly one third of all women in the 1500s when the witch trials began to escalate from previously much smaller numbers, about 10% of all women. Um, However, as we discussed in episode one of this series, prior to the witch trials in many regions and in many households, women were valued highly as narrowly skilled workers and often married late because their families wanted to keep them in the house for longer. However, it is worth noting that many of the women killed in the witch trials were old, widowed women or poor or otherwise disenfranchised women who were indeed misunderstood or who were perceived as a burden to their local communities. So this theory aligns with something called social functionalism theories, which basically just says these events actually <laughs> played a functional role in overcoming a shared social challenge at the time, which was the existence of inconvenient humans. That's, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a brutal way of saying anything, calling anybody an inconvenient human. Wow. Uh, absolutely brutal is maybe not a sentiment that we are unfamiliar with right now um that's very true yeah i i, I don't know i think that's kind of bad on that um and I, I mean again i i find this theory to lack breadth and depth like and also not be well universally applied so if you break it down on the regional level, there was a degree of differentiation in how what percentage of women were unmarried. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we see the witch trials sort of like spark fire that flees out of control across communities. So while this may be part, for me, again, and from uh, someone who is getting a PhD in a completely unrelated field and has like a couple books now of <laughs> and some peer-reviewed papers of information on this stuff. This doesn't, I think a lot of these series can slot together like puzzle pieces, mm -hmm. but the idea that the witch trials occurred because there were a lot of widows and unmarried women, it seems like a very extreme right. functional social tool. In a way, it kind of sounds like, um, because you, you see other social tools or ways of managing people. Um, you see similar uh, ones throughout this leading up to this time period. Uh, for example, the Crusades and their also terrible impact were kind of a management mm -hmm. tool to deal with a bunch of the like 
second sons of noble families who were upset wow, that's because wild. Is they that have, a real thing? yeah um that's awful there are lots of like not to go have them killed but to go get them out of you know get that unrest out of um out of the west and send them to go kill some people um Oof. so that's a theory surrounding why the crusades happened outside of the religious driving factors um, interesting yeah upsetting deeply okay so speaking of religion great transition another theory I came aqua- across quite a few times that a lot of folks seem to favor in writing about the witch trials is that the witch trials were a byproduct of religious squabbling another tool like this is again using um the terror campaign torture death of people predominantly women as a tool to forward personal or institutional agendas So a 2017 study published in the Economic Journal examined more than 43,000 people tried for witchcraft across 21 European countries over 55 years and found that witch trial activity correlated with, quote, religious marked contestation. Any idea what that might mean? Sorry, can you repeat that? Religious what? (laughs) Religious marked contestation. Marked constes constant <laughs> like contesting. Okay. Is it something like protesting religious beliefs or like questioning religious beliefs? Close. Um so at the time we talked about this a little bit in part one. There was growing unrest in the Roman Catholic Church, and Martin Luther had established and fought for the uh newly birthed protestant church this was the time of the protestant reformation and so these two were contesting to win the hearts of the public and so this study suggests that the churches may have used witch trials and the terror they sparked to either attract or fearmonger new followers into their parishes so in this 2017 study whether income and local state capacity So, you know, the economic stability, the crop stability of a region, the governmental stability seem to have less to do, again, via correlation with which trial activity then did whether or not the Protestant or Catholic church had a hard hold in the area in places where which religion was most established was contested. We see higher which which trial activities. Of course, while this study is really interesting and the correlation is like quite apparent, this study still doesn't quite explain the predominance of women, 75 to 85% of the accused. So again, really interesting uh, that this might've been used as like an institutional tool, but similar to the idea that this was used as a tool to rid society of quote undesirables, which is just the grossest possible way to say anything. Um, it, it doesn't seem to capture the, the picture in its entirety. Indeed, scholar Kurt Boschwitz refers to the witch trials as a, quote, war against old women. Yeah, that, so that rings true with some things that I've, um, heard as kind of going back to that management, um, whether or not it was, because older women, widowers, or otherwise who were kind of marginalized and lived on the outskirts of society, um, were whether or not they were just easy targets because they were, you know, kind of solitary um, and didn't have anyone to defend them or, you know, whatnot. I, I have heard that before that older women were particularly. Um, targeted in the witch trials yeah totally so there is this predominance of older women which may have been widows wise women you know and healers skilled in medical craft or midwives so unsatisfied with these theories again certainly socio-political economic turmoil it is deeply interrelated with the violence we see in this time period. The Protestant Reformation and the 
imbalance and infighting in two major religious institutions at the time certainly had something to do with the violence we see. Indeed, the Bible and the Malleus Maleficarum were inextricably related to the Roman Catholic Church. You know, Martin Luther had a lot of horrible things to say about women. That misogyny rooted in these predominant institutions, we can't, you know, act like that isn't part of what we see in this time period. But I kept looking. I, I wanted more insight into other reasons scholars suggest women were so predominantly impacted during this time period, predominantly victimized during this time period. Um, and so this is a really, really interesting one. And there's one paper I rely heavily on to talk about this. It's unclear to me how confident we can be that this was a major factor in the witch trials. But again, it was all happening this time period, and I would expect it all had a role to play. So Eric Ross, in his paper, Syphilis, Misogyny, and Witchcraft in the 16th Century Europe, um, spoilers, shares, posits that one of the reasons women may have been more often accused of witchcraft than men was due to the ways that syphilis showed up in 16th century European culture and life, which is wild. It is wild. When I found this paper, I was, it was not what I expected at all. Um, so as we've discussed, the Malleus Maleficarum posited that witches are mostly women. Witches stole penises, had sex with the devil, killed babies. Fun fact, witches were said to use the fat of said dead babies, the rendered fat, to grease their broomsticks when flying in sabbats. So there was that. They got really detailed about all the shit the witches did. There sure is that. <laughs> So scholar Eric Ross notes that misogyny alone doesn't explain this sudden bloodbath, which impacted predominantly women. Ross posits that the increase of women tried in the 16th century and the increase of accusations related to women killing babies and having sex with the devil may correspond with a rise and prevalence of syphilis in this time period in Europe. So Ross posits that syphilis was probably widespread due to increased social movement at this time period, wars going on at this time period, and that syphilis likely impacted every level of society at the time, from the very disenfranchised to the very wealthy. At the time, pregnant women with no other outward signs of the disease would likely have given birth to children with severe um Deformities with congenital syphilis, which results in this like horrific skin lesion, central nervous system damage, a, a number of organ disorders, as well as blindness and deafness. And that syphilis in women who were pregnant, who were not otherwise outwardly showing symptoms, also led to a potentially radically increased rate of stillbirths and spontaneous abortions. And in general, may have led to a catastrophic increase in infant mortality on the local or sort of the continental scale. During witch trials, infanticide was a common charge of those accused. Ross posits that this may have been related to the increase in syphilitic disorders and that women were midwives. So women were often the ones handling births that went wrong and obviously were mothers bearing children. And so who is to blame? Because Lord knows men were, you know, like we talked about, midwives usually held the most knowledge about women's reproductive cycles, about birth, about labor, about pregnancy. It was women who tended to these pregnant women, midwives, and the pregnant women themselves that were blamed for this unexplained and horrific illness at the time. So that might have been part of all the fuckery that was going on as well, literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's that's really I've not heard that before. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, I feel like I, I have heard that around this time, a lot of that syphilis was really common and that a lot of powerful, like leading men 
as we might call them, uh, developed neurosyphilis. Sure. Um, and so that a Got lot lost of these, their fucking gourds, huh? yeah, lose their fucking gourds, and we're just like real bad leaders. And then they were looked up to historically as kings who made like bold and revolutionary ideas, but really they just had fucking neurosyphilis. Um, their brains were like whack. Yeah, their brains literally didn't work. Um, so I think it's um, pretty interesting that there might be a connection between those two things. I also think. That it goes to show you, I mean, it's a very understandable connection, um, given the medical science of the time, which is to say, not no, really I mean, any. Um, I mean, I think we've talked about this in previous episodes, the connection between uh, midwifery and the um, what's it, propagation of men as medical doctors, uh, how there was kind of a con- contest there there was a little bit of competition there um and i think this could be an important driving factor in like looking at how that relationship changed and evolved um so yeah really super interesting stuff messed up messed up super interesting i think we should also hold in concert with that reality that sort of there was the establishment of puricism in this time period and um scientific ideals of medical practice by men were in their very early stages and there may have been competition between male doctors, air quotes, and midwives. That also a lot of midwives and women who engaged in medical practice were perceived by the communities they served to be partially able to accomplish successful outcomes through magical means, through unexplained means. And so you can kind of imagine how if you th- if you at the time thought when a midwife delivered a baby successfully, it was because of all this like esoteric, a little magical, unexplained knowledge that she had. If that child was then born like horrifically diseased and no one had ever seen a child born like that, and you already held the core belief that this woman was capable of some type of unexplained magic that drove different outcomes. That it's a double-edged sword that you also may have been easily convinced that she was behaving in malignant and harmful ways using her skills or magic or whatever you want to call it. So, of course, I want to emphasize this again. None of the theories I talk about today, none of the sense making we do, um, I think we can't take any of them as mutually exclusive. And all of them are set within a world of pervasive misogyny, as we talked about last time, of, of a misogyny that had been alive and well for thousands of years. So the likely best answer to what the fuck happened is actually a powder keg of horrific things that occurred during this time period that led to the assault of innocent people. So let's get back to what you initially brought up, though, because I find this this interpretation has the most impact for us today when we think about the witch trials and all they wrought. So let's talk about Sylvia Federici's theory of primitive accumulation. Several scholars point to large-scale social and economic systems changes occurring at the time of the early modern period witch trials. Europe was in a transition stage between feudalism and capitalism on top of everything else we've talked about Europe going through. Sylvia Federici forwards that the witch trials were vital for creating the conditions under which modern-day capitalism and historical capitalism would flourish. Federici posits that capitalism can only exist if first, what you referred to read, primitive accumulation is completed. Now, Federici defines primitive accumulation as the violent accumulation of humans as resource that allows capitalism to flourish. That is my paraphrase, not hers. And this includes exploitative practices such as violent colonization and slavery. In the context of women in feudal Europe, Federici suggests that primitive accumulation that paved the way for capitalism entailed the enslavement, the functional enslavement, of women to procreation and the house. That intentionally or unintentionally, the witch trials, the massive terror campaigns they entailed, and the policies associated with this horrific period in history created the conditions in which women had few societal roles to safely 
play outside of their homes. So that's terrible. It gets worse. (laughs) Oh boy. As we talked about previously, women had, prior to the witch trials, women had access to power. Now that doesn't mean they weren't downtrodden, disenfranchised, and there weren't pervasive, horrific stereotypes, etc. that pervaded their lives, but they had access to power-making tools, much of which could not be easily commodified. As we've talked about, women dominated healing fields, midwifery, often held esteem in their local communities as wise women, or were informal community leaders with lots of sort of lateral social power. As we have referred to in this podcast before, witches were and are a non-consumer category. They escaped the bounds of monetary value, as did women who you know, would not ask for pay for their services, but would ask for reciprocity in their community. They did not fit into the quickly forming mold of early modern period capitalism. A quote from Federici, establishing capitalism is difficult in the era of belief in magic. Magic itself embodies from a capitalistic lens, something for nothing. It defies empirical explanation. It is spiritual and oriented towards community, solidarity, and individual power. Magic, or even unexplained practice, values the qualitative over the quantitative. So Federici posits convincingly that rebellious women, magic and wise women, healers who worked for lateral power and reciprocity rather than money, and disenfranchised women, widows, the poor, or mentally unwell on society's fringes, were all antithetical to the rise of capitalism, a new economic system in early modern period Europe. And again, I want to emphasize this, while women were not equal to men under feudalism. If you're listening to this and want more, we cover that extensively in part one of the series. But women were also not confined to a tiny, narrow definition of use, big air quotes, and life way. Federici notes that for most of capitalist history, the official, big air quotes, job of women was to produce the workforce via creating humans in their bodies and raising them healthy and productive. (laughs) What a horrible reductionist way to think about humans. Fucking thanks, capitalism. Good shit. Very cool capitalism. (sighs) So Federici and several other scholars see the witch hunts and terror campaign that wrapped Europe in this era as a curtailing of women's rights even further, a means to restrict personal freedom, job opportunity, freedom of expression, abortion, contraception, homosexuality, sex for pleasure or fun or whatever, midwifery and healing practice. In a new economic and social model of capitalism, that emerge on the other end of the witch trials, women were expected to produce and rear the workforce and manage the home all without pay. Yeah, I mean, kind of mentioned this earlier, but women kind of in under capitalism and as kind of we think of, you know, when we're talking about femininity as proposed by these kind of beliefs are essentially a working class that goes unpaid. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And it's a really interesting read because despite being a feminist for I like to think all my life, even though I've had varying degrees of internalized misogyny over that period, I had never thought critically about that Um, actually until a dear mentor of mine uh, who said something about that, said something about how ridiculous it is that women aren't paid for literally creating and raising and keeping society working. Um, and that that is what this whole idea of primitive accumulation is, that if you want a system like capitalism to work, you can't come on, you have to accumulate base services that you cannot possibly pay for. So you steal people and enslave them. So you steal land and pretend that you didn't do it a hundred years later. So you convince women that their work isn't worth anything when in fact capitalism, I don't think could, well, 
capitalism couldn't function as we know it now if we paid if we commodified the service when women provide through their bodies to the mm. world women provide in their homes to the world it couldn't make it no um and we commodify everything else right mm-hmm. but not women that's just their natural desire is to rear babies not that there's anything wrong with rearing babies. That's great. I'm here for it. But women deserve to be paid for the work they do for society. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard somebody say, um, I can't I don't remember the context at all, but I remember my reaction to hearing somebody say women should be paid for raising children. I was like, what? What? No, why? I know. What? Same. It's just, it's a sentiment that you don't hear. And I think that's starting to change slowly but surely. Um, the march of progress is slow. Um, I think a great example of capitalism's double standard regarding women's work is so, you know, right now in Canada, and I think in general in Canada, not just during a pandemic, if you are bringing your children to childcare, you are eligible for a grant from the government to pay for that childcare, to offset the cost of that childcare. Wait, why? What? I mean, you're also like you get tax deductions when you have kids. But if you are a stay at home mom, you are ineligible for any grants from the government to care for your children. So, so strange. Yeah. I, I, you know, again, this is the whole idea of primitive accumulation. And now I, I want to be really clear here Federici is not positing that this terror campaign that resulted in women as defined solely in relationship to male workers was a result of p- the powers that be playing a long game to primitively accumulate women. She's not saying that. She's not saying this is like some conspiracy that fits perfectly into everything we see in this time and that the witch trials were crafted by powerful men to create the conditions under which capitalism could exist. She's not saying that. However, she is saying that this environment created the only conditions under which capitalism as we know it could persist and thrive. So this idea of primitive accumulation is really interesting, that the system we currently all live within, participate in, and accept could only really work when conditions like this arose, where you are not paying people for doing things, you know, when you only commodify some things and not all things. Yeah, so... Federici hypothesizes that witch hunt trials um, and general widespread terror was a fire in which modern capitalistic ideals of women that persist until this day were forged. The expectations for women after the trials, which are intuitive if you consider all the stuff we've talked about, were that women who weren't witches, who didn't deserve death and torture, were quiet, were chaste, and worked solely within the home. Mm-hmm. Remember, witches were women who worked outside of the home as midwives or healers. The accused may have been infertile or childless. They may have been disenfranchised or angry widows. They may have been the sexual, the independent. Witches were accused of killing children, having sex with demons, emasculating men, which, as it is still sometimes used today, was weaponized to through violence and death squeeze women into the home and into child rearing as singular purpose into definition only in relation to their husbands, their sons, and their brothers into vessels with ovaries instead of the full, powerful, whole, flourishing human beings that in reality they actually are. Mm -hmm. So again, this does not, it is still hard to comprehend the absolute horror the grotesque human behavior the way um accusations you know consumed the countryside of europe like wildfire during this over 200 year period and i don't think any explanation could make us feel like oh i get it i get it i'm I'm comforted by this but i find federici's interpretation of the consequences of this event as laying the groundwork for a system that we still all live within really important to 
hold space for and to think about. And of course, there were also other preconditions for modern day capitalism. I want to make that clear. Uh, One article I found, which I'll link in the show notes, suggests that witch trials, in addition to the Catholic Church's institutional power, that the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church at this time, that it's, quote, zest for discovery, enterprise, and wealth creation, end quote, created the preconditions for modern day capitalism as well. So nothing is as simple as saying, oh my God, the witch trials made capitalism. The ball rolling towards, like, in the direction of free market and capitalism was already occurring before the witch trials took place. But they stuck women into the exact right position, um, a horrible position, for capitalism to produce a massive workforce, which could allow the rich to get richer and the Catholic Church to create more wealth. Mm. Uh, So, yeah, I just, I... I, I think it is really important to consider how the ash of the witch trials have fallen yes, <laughs> across so. our modern conception of the world. Yeah, I mean, totally. And it's, I mean, it's ultimately why I study, um, you know, ancient history and mm-hmm. pre-modern history, uh, because these things do have long lasting impacts. Um, I think a great example of something um, that has very modern repercussions outside of the obvious subject we're talking about right now is perceptions of the Middle East um, dating back mm-hmm. to like the uh, you know seventh, eighth, ninth century um, as a magical place, which then leads to the Crusades, which then leads to you know modern war on terror. Um, it's not a direct path. It, zigzagging and it's complicated but it's important to be able to have some conception of it um i agree um i i think we're i don't think i was taught history in a way that allowed me to see those ripples um in a in a critical way uh which is part of the reason i've enjoyed this project this audio experiment so much um is because i've gotten to apply all the tools that i've have been hard won through my time in academia to i again like things i'm still learning and i'm in baby baby steps in understanding history and if you're an expert listening to this you're probably pulling your hair out but it i also feel like learning this stuff redoubles my desire to like get over my body shame and to stop being polite to men who sexually harass me and to take up as much space as possible and be anything but the prevailing ideal woman. I think learning about this stuff adds fuel to the already like very angry fire in women or non-binary people or gay people or anyone who isn't rich and white and hetero and cis and you know even those people too i'm sure it adds fuel to the fire if they are decent people Mm -hmm. but you can see the traces of like the modern perfect woman built in the fucking fires of the witch hunts. You can see that women of this time period to survive would have had to be quiet, would have had to be invisible, would have had to shrink, like would have had to stay home, Mm -hmm. um, would have had to meet a very narrow window of acceptable social standards in order to not just be considered desirable, but to not be tortured and killed. So I think learning about this stuff, it it helps to de- demystify bullshit societal standards, some of which are rooted or were emphasized by the witch trials. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Most certainly. Yeah, and, and so arguably the witch trials and the fallout and all that followed are a major force in shaping how we all think, behave, and understand gender social roles and contracts today. Witch trials emerged from a world of spiritual and systemic sexism amid chaos, fear, misunderstanding, scapegoatism. I just invented that word. Maybe, maybe it's a real word. <laughs> and hate. <laughs> 
Witch trials ended not because of an end to the belief in witchcraft, but because a terror campaign had successfully dealt with the, quote, undesirables, forcing generations of women against each other and into the narrow and restrictive box of what defined a safe and socially acceptable woman. And I you know, seriously think that we cannot disentangle any of this relatively recent history. I mean, you know, 300 years ago at the tail end of it. I don't think we can disentangle it from the patriarchal capitalist system we live in today. No, well, certainly not. Especially as we see the term witch hurled like rotten tomatoes from angry, scared men at politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Hillary Clinton. Especially as women are shamed for choosing to have a career and kids or have no kids or for having kids but not raising them in the exact way society dictates. Mm -hmm. Especially as, like, I don't think we can disentangle this pervasive terror campaign from modern day purity culture, whether inside the church or outside of it, you know, from words like slut, whore, and bitch. Like I said, I think this is tied up in Eurocentric thin beauty and behavior standards to Mm -hmm. literally all people who happen to be born with a vulva. Um, And I think it's also important to note here, you know, we, in the first episode of the series, we gestured to the fact that witch trials expanded far beyond Europe. This was sort of the first time trials and hunts occurred at such a mass scale and produced such hysteria, but they would travel with colonizers. The the ideas of the witch hunt and the tactics utilized would travel with colonizers to the non-white world um, and would result, you know, in the horrific torture and death of indigenous and black and other women of color throughout the world. Um, And and that witch trials persist into the 21st century, impacting men, women, non-binary people, and children in Nigeria, Zambia, Papua New Guinea, India, the Republic of Benin, and beyond. Femicide, violence against women, sexual harassment, and assault, all which are certainly in part tied up in this horrific history, though also tied up with just like the history of misogyny far before the witch trials but but the roots of all of these horrific things intertwine with the roots of the early modern europe period witch trials and i think the witch trials like created countless offshoots of terror and femicide and witch trials that that are still like so much alive um yeah, I, I I actually am kind of, believe it or not, struggling to find enough words to talk about how pervasive I feel the beliefs that preceded the witch trials and that resulted from them are today, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think something that you can, it's hard to quantify it. Um, not only is it something that is hard for me to understand as somebody who identifies as male and who has always identified as male um it becomes tricky for me to try to understand what the ramifications of it and even if you are just looking at it in a you know isolated empirical i hope you can hear the thick ass quotes yeah surrounding that one it, it's still something that's it's it's a qualitative experience um mm-hmm. that has quantitative uh, outcomes, you know, which we see in all of the things that comprise uh, misogyny and discrimination against uh, women, and especially uh, women of color. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Predominantly, and especially women of color. Yeah. Yeah, and on <laughs> on this harrowing note, um, because I am just sort of like emotionally and intellectually overwhelmed with trying to articulate how I feel about these theories, how I feel about this time, what we can take from this that is useful besides just like, again, realization that everything you've been taught about your self-expression or the way your body is being wrong is 
horseshit built on violence. Yeah. Built on more horseshit built on more violence. So I'll leave us with, you know, heavy but newly informed with this excerpt from Fia Forstrom, who is an independent artist and songwriter, who I will link in the show notes. Quote, It was not witches who burned. It was women. Women who were seen as too beautiful, too outspoken, had too much water in the well. Yes, seriously. Who had a birthmark. Women who were too skilled with herbal medicine, too loud, too quiet, too much red in their hair. Women who had a strong nature connection. Women who danced, women who sang, or anything else, really. Any woman was at risk of burning in the 1600s. Sisters testified and turned on each other when their babies were held under ice. Children were tortured to confess their experiences with, quote, witches by being fake executed in ovens. Women were held underwater, and if they could float, they were guilty and executed. If they sank and drowned, they were innocent. Women were thrown off cliffs. Women were put in deep holes in the ground. Why do I write this? Because knowing our history is important when we are building a new world. When we are doing the healing work of our lineages and as women, to give the women who were slaughtered a voice, to give them redress and a chance of peace. It was not the witches who burned. It was women. So, on that note, read my brother who has tolerated like five or six hours now of very heavy <laughs> content. <laughs> We're signing off from the early modern period witch trials topic, and we will certainly have you back on, maybe for something like slightly less sinister, but I don't know, maybe maybe. for like a hero episode, (laughs) maybe an episode where we'll talk about a heroine, a woman who crushed the patriarchy despite overwhelming barriers, because those are coming up, I promise to you and everyone else. We had a lot of groundwork to lay, but those are coming up. Mm. Um. Anything you want to share or plug before we close out today? Yeah. So, uh, like Lauren said, my name is Reed. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok and Twitter. I don't use Twitter ever. Uh, Mm -mm. At Reed Eckert. I went to tag you on Twitter the other day and you had like four followers and your last tweet was like from 2017. So I was like, I'm not going to. That sounds about right. Sorry, I interrupted. (laughs) No, you can find me uh, at all those at at, at Reed Eckert, R E D E C K E R T, Reed Eckert. Excellent. Awesome. And thank you again for being with us, Reed. As always, you can get more at The Witch Podcast at The Witch Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. We are actually active on both platforms. (laughs) Reed. Um, (laughs) And on Facebook at The Witch Pod. You're active on Facebook? Failed. Yeah, Facebook page. Wow. Um, Wild. Yeah, we're all over the place, right? We're trying to make our mark. Mm. And yeah, this week, we would be absolutely thrilled if you shared our podcast or something that you learned from it or a favorite quote on your platform of choice. As always, rating, reviewing, and subscribing on iTunes is a huge help for our little baby podcast at this stage. And I am so grateful for all of you for listening, for sending me amazing suggestions, and especially for sending kind, resonant words. So thank you all. Thank you, Reed. I hope you are all able to do some of that healing work of our lineages and of our women today, that you get a chance to get outside, that you wash your hands after you get back from the grocery store. And that you find a way to hex the patriarchy today. Until next time. <laughs>